Uh, this week, uh, we continue in our series, How to Prepare uh, for the End. So go ahead and grab your Bibles. I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, also, I'm going to have you turn a little bit later to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. But today, we're going to be talking uh, uh, about the rapture. We're going to be talking about the uh, point in time when the church will exit the earth at the second coming of Christ. How many of you guys have heard the word rapture before? If you raise your hand if you've heard that before. Okay, go ahead and put them down. How about how many of you think you could confidently explain the events surrounding the rapture to another individual? Anybody in here? Well, great, then this is going to be a great message for you. This is going to be great and helpful to help everybody kind of understand the events surrounding uh, the rapture. And, you know, I've taught on this many times, took some classes on it in college and all that type of thing. And still, even this week, like a good old movie, I learned something new. You know, some new stuff jumped out at me. And so no matter how much you do know uh, about the rapture, about the end of when Christ comes back, uh, you're going to learn something new today, guaranteed, as you take a look at it. But we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's just kind of get right into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 50 through 58. The Apostle Paul says this, I declared to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will raise, be raised imperishable, and we too will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will become true. Death has swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is a law, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is one of the key texts talking uh, about the rapture, but there's another one as well. And as I kind of started here this week, I found myself pulling from this other one heavily, so I want to read both texts for you this morning. So hold your finger there and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's to the right if you're new to the Bible. Um, it's about that far to the right if you want to find yourself there. As long as your pages are the same thickness, that is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to become ignorant about those who have fallen asleep, a.k.a. died, okay? Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again so that we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left in, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now, brothers, about the times and the dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. Let me just pray. Father, thank you for these texts. Thank you that you have given us enough information to uh, encourage us, enough information to excite us, God, enough information to keep us focused on the prize, uh, to serve you with our whole heart. And I pray that today you would bring clarity. You would bring clarity to these texts. You would bring clarity as even as I speak and, and even as uh, we listen to you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, if you have something to write with, it'd be a good thing to have uh, by your side, uh, be ready to go, jot some notes down. I'm going to be covering a lot of different scriptures today. I have placed all of the scriptures, or at least the majority of the scriptures that I'm going to be covering on the screen. You can, of course, write down the references. And if you um, would like to, you can still go out back, write the table as you walk in the door here. There are some different note sheets. They're there every single week. You can grab one on your way in. Um, or just write somewhere else, some, maybe some scrap piece of paper you have down. But uh, I just am going to go through um, and answer four specific questions uh, about the rapture. And I'm going to give you some different uh, scriptures to look up for you to look up this morning and then for you to look up later. And so just please uh, follow along with me here. Four key questions uh, about the rapture. The first question that many people often answer is when will the, or often ask is when will the rapture happen? When will the rapture take place? Many people have debated this uh, for a long period of time. Ever since Jesus said he was coming back, people have kind of been debating on when this is going to happen. They've been debating on it specifically as to when it's going to happen in relationship to the great tribulation. Uh, many people say, I am a pre-tribber. I am a post-tribber. I am a mid-tribber. Those are the kind of three main views that are out there about when the rapture will happen in light of or in, res, in, in regards to or around in relationship with the great tribulation. If somebody is pre-trib, they believe that the rapture will happen before the tribulation comes about. If you've ever read the books Left Behind or heard people talk about the books Left Behind, the author takes a pre-tribulation view. That means before any bad things ever happen on the earth, the church will be raptured out. That is pre-trib. Uh, other people are mid-trib. They believe that the rapture will happen in the middle of the tribulation, maybe three and a half years in because the tribulation is seven years in length. So maybe three and a half years in, right smack dab in the middle, that's when the church is going to be raptured out. And then there are others who are post-trib. They believe it's after the tribulation, at the end of all of the bad things that are going to happen. That is when the church is taken out. So you have pre, you have mid, and you have post. Maybe you have been wondering which view is biblical. I am glad you're here today because finally you're going to know. Today is the day when it will all be settled in your mind, because the Apostle Paul, right here in 1 Corinthians 15, he tells us clearly when the rapture will happen. It will happen at the last trumpet. It will happen at the last trumpet. The trumpet is a consistent marker. You probably noticed both passages we read today. Also, Jesus talks about the trumpet, and then John talks about the trumpet in Revelation as well. But the return of Christ, the rapture of the church, will happen at the last trumpet. You know, trumpets are, um, uh, think back to some old-time movies or maybe some history books you've read. People would announce the arrival of very important people with trumpets, right? Bum, 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 the king of Camelot, right? And the king would come walking in usually a roly-poly guy, you know, would come walking in, and, he, and they would just announce the coming of this king. So too, an angel is going to announce the coming of the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is going to blow a trumpet, and this activity of Christ coming back will sound off. Take a look at some scriptures here. Jot these down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. I tell you, mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, say it with me, last trumpet at the last trumpet here's another good one matthew chapter 24 verse 31 as you look at this he says he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four corners of the earth so this trumpet's going to happen this trumpet's going to blow and and then the followers of christ are going to be raptured up first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 uh, the Apostle Paul tells us here that at the trumpet call of God, it's at the trumpet call of God that those who are alive will be caught up together with those who have previously died in the air. And then also Revelation chapter 11, which I want you to turn to. Revelation chapter 11, you will see the last trumpet spoken of there. In Revelation uh, John lays out for us exactly how many trumpets there are going to be. 
And then he tells us in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, at the seventh trumpet, or when the seventh trumpet sounds, there will be a loud voice in heaven that says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The reign of Christ, which is also synonymous with the return of Christ, which is when the rapture happens, happens here, according to John in Revelation chapter 11, at the seventh trumpet. If you go back and look at Revelation chapter 8, you will see that there are only seven trumpets. Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared to sound them. And they began to sound and make an announcement about different things that will be taking place. So one guy comes out, angel, and he blows a trumpet. As he blows the trumpet, action takes place on the earth. Second angel comes out, blows a trumpet, certain things take place. And at the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trumpet, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh trumpet, then Christ returns, and it's at this point that the church is raptured. Now, the Apostle Paul also tells us how fast this rapture will happen. It will happen in a flash. In a flash. The events of the rapture will happen quickly. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 again. He says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. You just blink. Oh, it could be that fast. Not that fast. Right there. That's how fast these events are all going to take place. Super quick. The little video we showed, it was kind of a little dark. Maybe you couldn't see it. There are people slowly floating to, up into the air. You know, it's a great video, but it's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen very quickly. Whoo! The bang! It's all going to take place in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Jumper. Have you ever seen the movie Jumper? Anybody in here? That's about as fast as I can imagine. You know, all of a sudden somebody's teleported to another place. It's like, boom, quick. They are gone. Which is good, because I don't know if your clothes are going to stay here when you're raptured. And I don't want to see a bunch of naked people floating up, you know. <laughs> That'd just be awkward, right? Just an awkward thing. You don't want to see a bunch of naked people floating up, do you? Say no. No. No, you don't. So it's going to happen really quick. Now, if we could slow down, if we could slow down the events described for us, the Apostle Paul tells us that there is an order to how this will take place in a flash. There is actually an order to these events if you could somehow slow them down and look at them one at a time. Some high-speed footage could capture this if you just kind of slowed it down. So we're going to look at what is the rapture. What is the rapture? Let's just kind of take a, a look at that. What is the rapture? The rapture, the word rapture, is not found in your Bible. You cannot read, you can read the entire English Bible and you will not find the word rapture. Some of you don't believe me. Right now you're starting to do a search to try to figure out if I'm wrong. But trust me, it's not in the Bible. The word rapture isn't. The word rapture is a Latin word that means to be caught up. It's a Latin word that means to be caught up. If you were reading the Latin Bible, then you would find a root of this word in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. We who are alive and still remain will be caught up, will be raptured. That's where we get the word rapture from. It's like the word trinity. The word trinity is not found in the Bible. It's not in there. It's just a word that we use to describe a reality, that God is three persons in one. It's a word that we have created to describe a reality that is true. So is the word rapture. It is used to describe a reality that will take place in the future. So the word rapture comes from the Latin meaning caught up. The events, there are certain events that will take place at the rapture. There are certain things that will happen. And the rapture is the event. It is the event when the physical bodies of Christ followers will be transformed. It is the event when the physical bodies of Christ's followers will be transformed. Now I know if you're like me, you only think of the, the people who are alive being 
raptured up at that point. But actually, there are other events that are taking place at the rapture other than just God's people exiting the earth and meeting Christ in the air. There are other events, and it is the primary reason why we need the rapture is to transform the physical bodies of Christ followers. Notice what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. He says that at this rapture, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. The transformation of the physical body of the Christ follower is the reason that we need the rapture. Yes, we will be rescued from what's going on on the planet, but that's not the primary reason why we have the rapture. We have the rapture to transform the bodies. The normal process for transforming the bodies is death. Death is the normal process to transform a body. The Apostle Paul, if you go back and read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see the Apostle Paul says that God is producing something new. He is giving people a spiritual body well into the future so that they can live on the other side. What he tells us here is that um, uh, when we die physically, our bodies stay here in the ground, even though our spirits go to be with the Lord. They stay here. That's the normal process of transformation. However, if you are still alive when Christ comes back, you're not going to go through that normal process of transformation. Therefore, the rapture completes this transformation, both of the physical bodies of those who are alive and the physical bodies of those who have already died. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Can you just take a look at it in your, in your scripture there? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood can't get you to the other side. You need a new body to exist over there. And we're going to be talking about that new body here in a second, but you just have to understand that we're being caught up so that we can be transformed. Which takes us to our next question. Um, how will the events of the rapture unfold? If we could slow it down and look at it in a blink of an eye, look at this transformational process, how would this all unfold? Again, keep in mind this is going to happen in a flash. Um, it's going to happen very fast. This is where you would shout back, how fast will it? All right, so hold on, hold on, hold on. we got to do this right. This is going to happen very fast. Oh, you guys did so good. It is going to be just like a Michigan fan leaving the Ohio State Stadium yesterday. OH. All right, thank you. One of you out there. Appreciate it. Congratulations, Buckeyes. Uh, how will the events um, unfold? Here we go. Step number one. This is the first thing that will happen. The trumpet will sound, and Christ will suddenly appear in the sky. A trumpet will sound, and Christ will appear in the sky. Like lightning is seen in the sky, so too Jesus will appear in the sky. We looked at that last week, Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. He will appear in the sky suddenly, and all people will see him somehow and in some way. He will be visible to everybody. He will return. That's step number one. Step number two, the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead bodies of Christ followers will rise first. How many of you know somebody that has been a follower of Christ and yet they have died? Raise your hand if you know somebody. Sure. So think of that person. The first thing that will happen is that Christ will appear in the sky, and then dead bodies are going to shoot out of the ground, come out of the water, come out of the ashes, whatever it is. They're going to shoot up into the sky first. The Apostle Paul here says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, the dead will rise. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The dead in Christ will rise first. We will not, the, those who are alive will not precede those who have already fallen asleep or who have already died. This seems odd to me. This seems very odd. Why does God want their bodies anyway? What's it, how's this all going to happen? 
I mean, you know as well as I do how, uh, you know, bodies decompose over time. How's he even going to find them? You like, you know, take the worm up there with them? I mean, how is this all going to happen? You know, people aren't, physical bodies aren't there anymore. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to take place. The scripture doesn't tell us how it's going to take place. It's one of those things we just got to go, oh, God said it's going to take place, so it's going to. It does make us wonder why. Why does he want these bodies? I think we get a hint in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you go look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, you will see the Apostle Paul says that our physical bodies were bought with a price. The reason why we honor God with our physical bodies right now the reason why it's important that you take care of your body, the reason why it's important that you don't use your body for immorality, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is because Christ bought it with his blood. He purchased you. Not just the spiritual you, but the physical you as well. He's purchased all of you with his blood on the cross. And so he's going to come back and get what is his. And that includes the physical bodies of those who have fallen asleep beforehand. So Christ appears, and then the dead in Christ will rise. And then it says in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that living Christ followers will then join or will then meet both the previously dead Christ followers and Christ in the air as well. So Christ comes back, he brings with him all of those who have died before, raises their bodies, then rips us off of the planet, and we all join each other up in heaven. 1 Corinthians um, tells us here uh, that we will all be changed, verse 52. We will all be changed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. We will be with them, and we will meet them with the Lord in the air, in the air. Man, this is going to happen really, really quick, but uh, I've been practicing. I've been practicing for this day. I'm going to be like this. <laughs> Actually, Christy and I, a few years ago, went to the state fair, and we um, got in one of those ball things that has a bungees attached to it. Have you seen this? It's got big cranes that go up and big bungees that come down, and we were strapped in there, and they're really cruel. They wait and wait, and then when you just get settled in, they launch you like into the sky. I did not like that feeling at all. I'm not a big fan of that leaving your stomach thing, you know, but I'm just trusting that because it happens so fast that it's not going to bother me so much when Christ comes back, but it is going to happen quickly, and the cool thing is that we get to meet people in the air that have gone before us. Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he's trying to encourage people, if you go back and read the context, he says, listen, don't grieve like those who have fallen, about those who have fallen asleep like the world does, because you'll get to see them again. And so you have this idea that in the sky there's going to be this big party as we are united with those who have gone before us and with Christ himself. We're literally going to be saying, what's up, you know? <laughs> you are. That's right. We're going to meet them in the air, and it's going to be a big-time celebration. That is how the rapture is going to unfold. Uh, question four, what are the effects? What are the effects of the rapture itself? As you probably gathered, there's more effects than just people being taken off the earth and being rescued. So what are the effects? One of the effects is that you'll be given a new spiritual body. All Christ followers will be given a new spiritual body on that day. This is great news. Because as you know, the older you get, the worse your body gets. Because of sin and the decay of, the decay of things, because death has come onto our physical bodies, then we have been rotting even though we're alive. And, and we will rot in the future if we don't make it all the way until Christ returns. We will rot in the ground. Our bodies are decaying. We are going the wrong direction with our bodies. And we were not meant to decay. This is not how God intended it to be. So he is going to give us a new body. The Apostle Paul says that your physical body is like a seed. It's planted in the ground, as it were. And it produces a great 
fruit. The seed looks one way, but after it dies, it produces life. So too, when you are dead and gone, or when you are raptured up, you're going to be given a new body, and this new body is going to allow you to exist in the new kingdom of God here on heaven, here in heaven and on earth. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. We will be clothed with the imperishable. We will be clothed with the imperishable. You will somehow get a new body. Now, some have speculated about what this new body is going to look like, and, and maybe you've heard people do that. They speculate about what this new body is going to be like. Um, it is a little bit like, to me, the debate about whether Adam had a belly button. I mean, he was never born, so he had no umbilical cord. Did he ever have a belly button? Well, I've done a lot of research on this, and uh, uh, the Bible confidently declares that he, he did have a belly button, and it wasn't any. It wasn't any. Amen from all the innies? All right. So it's a little bit like that, but if you allow me to just kind of go down this road for a little bit, because maybe you've wondered what this body's going to be like. The primary um, reasoning, and I, think, and I think the best reasoning, is that it's probably going to be like Christ's body after he was raised from the dead. So what does Christ's body look like? What, what does it look like after he is raised from the dead? Well, it looks like him somehow. Even though he has a resurrected body, it still looks like him somehow. Yet he's able to like go through walls, right? He can go through walls, he can enter locked rooms. The cool thing is, and this is really cool, he could still eat with this new resurrected body. This is good news for us. He could still eat. I'm excited about that. Looking forward to eating in heaven. And uh, uh, also, some people even speculated that we're going to all be about the age of 33. Because that was the age Jesus was when he died. Now that can't be true, because we all know that a 40-year-old body is the heavenly body, right? <laughs> now, I mean, how do we know? We don't know. You know, we don't know what happens with little kids that have died before. Do they get an older-looking body? Do they keep a younger-looking? We don't know. It doesn't say. But we can tell this. It's going to be a better body than the one you have here. No more cancer, no more heartache, no more defect. And, and really, one of the hardest things to imagine is no more desire to sin. Another effect of the rapture is death will lose. Death and sin will lose on that day. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, then the saying will be true. Where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, where is this sting of death that you have held over us for so long? It is gone. I love that there's like trash talking going on on the day Christ comes back. Na 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 boo boo, we beat you. Death, you lose. You lose sin. No more effect on us. No more effect, no more lust, no more insecurities. No more urges to do the wrong thing. Death and sin will be crushed once for all at the rapture of the church. Death and sin will be crushed. There's another effect that the truth of the rapture has on us, and it's not an effect that's only in the future, but it's an effect right now. The rapture should encourage us to stand firm and to serve now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, encourage one another with these words. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, stand firm and give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, for you know that it is not in vain. As we look forward to that future day of meeting Christ in the air and, and the loved ones who have gone before when all of our questions will be answered and our, our faith will no longer be without sight, but we'll see what we, have, what we now believe in all of its fullness and all of the doubts fade away. Because we know that day is coming, we can be encouraged to stand firm now. Because we know that day is coming, we can go through difficulties 
right now. And maybe you're going through a difficulty today. Maybe things just seem to be pressing in upon you. Maybe you just can't seem to make sense out of it all. You don't understand why it's going the way it is. You wish God would just clear it all up. You wish he would say something to you. Here's what he wants to say to you. Don't worry, this is temporary. There is coming a day when all of this will be wrapped up. That physical body of yours that's decaying, that doesn't work, that doesn't, doesn't treat you well, yeah, I got a new one for you. Don't worry. That hardship you're going through, don't worry, I'm going to wipe away every tear from your eye. I am coming back to get you. Be encouraged. And stand firm. Stand firm not only against the desires to be wayward, not only, to, not, only, not only against the persecutions that could come your way, but stand firm and continue to serve. Don't become weary in doing good, for you know in a due time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Stand firm, as Paul says here at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Stand firm and give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that everything that you do will be reward, you will be rewarded for on that day. Now, from time to time, my wife and I, we go out, you know, we get invited to go to dinner somewhere, or we just, you know, take it upon ourselves to go out, and our children are old enough to be at home alone, and so we leave all three kids at home alone, and uh, when we do, we usually give them an assignment, right? Okay, Sydney, you need to empty the dishwasher. Caleb, you need to fill up the dishwasher, and Peyton, you need to clear the table, you know, you need to clear the table over to the sink, and then sink needs to go in, and, you know, all that type of stuff needs to happen while we're gone. Now, sometimes, when we come home, the table is still dirty, the sink is still full, and the dishwasher is full. What, I, what can I say? My kids are evil. I don't know. They just, uh, you know, they're just, it probably never happens at your house. Never. But from time to time, on a rare occasion, that will happen. And we can always tell why. They got distracted. They got distracted. They were watching iCarly. They were playing Xbox. They were watching Cupcake Wars. Something else was distracting them from the task at hand, right? Now, when this happens, on the rare occasion that it does, we don't kick them out. At least we're not going to admit that we kick them out, or it's not for long. We don't kick them out of the family, right? But man, when we do come home, and the table's clear, and the sink is empty and clean, all the dishes are put away in the right place, and the dishwasher is running, how do you think we feel? We're like, that was awesome! You guys are rock stars! Way to go, thank you so much. Because in a perfect world, they would be, of course, motivated by their love for us. And so they would do it because we asked them to. And they would be excited that when we return to show off all of the great work that they have done. Men and women, stand firm. Let us not be children who get distracted by trivial things in life. Let us not get distracted by things that don't have any eternal consequence to them at all. But let us serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Let us not give up. Let us live our lives in such a way, encouraged to know that Christ is coming back for us, and also devoted and motivated and, and enduring because we know that he is coming back. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you have not left us as orphans, but you sent your spirit as a deposit, as a guarantee for someday you will return and get us. And God, I pray that today you would inspire us, you would encourage us, and God, you would motivate us to stand firm, to seek you with all of our heart, to give you our whole selves, knowing that one day you're going to come back and get us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.